first of all, thank you, uh, everyone, to coming to my talk today. Um, I know there's a lot of places here. There's a lot of speakers you could be listening to. Appreciate you coming out to mine. Uh, my name is Jamie Keach. Uh, I'm a mining engineer. I'm the founder of a newsletter called Resource Insider. And what we do at Resource Insider is we go out and we look for venture stage opportunities in the mining and natural resource sector. We invest our own money. Our subscribers, our readers, they get to invest alongside us on the same terms. That's it. That's the whole business model. We look for things that we think will make money. I'm also the uh, chairman of a carbon credit investment firm called Vita Carbon and a partner at a group called Inventa Capital here in Vancouver. So how to get rich selling toilet paper. This might seem like a little bit off topic for a mining conference, but I'm going to start with a story. And uh, it, it really highlights the way that I think about investing in natural resources and commodities. And I think probably a lot of you think about it the same way if you're here. And you know, I'd like to get some feedback on that afterwards. So let's start with a story. Does anyone know what this is? Fire Festival. Did anyone go to Fire Festival? So there's actually a Netflix documentary on this. It's awesome. If you ever want to see a bunch of spoiled little rich kids crying on a beach or an island, this is the one for you. Fire Festival was going to be the greatest music festival of all time. It was in the Bahamas. There were Instagram models, there were billionaires, there were yachts. It was run by these two idiots. Uh, ja Rule, who is a rapper, and a guy named Billy McFarlane, who is effectively a con artist. This is what they were selling. Beautiful tents, beaches, boats, lots of these. It was going to be a phenomenal experience. People were paying up to $12,000 to go for a weekend. This is what it actually looked like. So this is not a refugee camp. It's not a FEMA disaster. Uh, all these people that flew in on private jets from New York and LA and people from Vancouver. They got there and they ended up staying in these things. It was a complete shit show. There was no food, there was no water, there was actually no way off the island. One of those poor bastards I showed you before actually went to jail for this because they promised the world, spent all their money on promotion and then there were actually no bands playing at this music festival. But. Never got a good crisis go to waste by Winston Churchill. This is probably my favorite quote. I think I probably say that about three times a week. And many of the people at Fire Festival embodied this idea. So like any good entrepreneur, there were people hoarding water, hoarding sunscreen, and of course, hoarding toilet paper. So if you wanted to go to the bathroom at Fire Festival, you had to pay $10. Is it a bad thing to do? Probably but it's kind of entrepreneurial. Where else have we seen this before? So that was on a very micro scale. And if you'll think back to a few years ago, at the start of the pandemic, we got to see this on a mass scale. If you remember, people were buying toilet paper, they were buying hand sanitizer, they were buying masks. Never let a good crisis go to waste, right? So this was the individual that was putting their money and buying these essential items. And the main takeaway from this is very obvious that people are willing to spend a lot more money on things that become essential in an emergency, when there's a shortage, or even when there's a fear of a shortage, whether it's on one island in the Bahamas or it's the entire world. So let's take a look at the world today. I actually made this presentation this morning and I made this slide in about 30 seconds and I was able to think of all those things off the top of my head. In the last couple of years, we've had a pandemic. So we've seen billions and billions of dollars poured into pharmaceutical companies by governments. We have broken supply chains. We have a war in Ukraine that has brought in, I don't know how many hundreds of billions, maybe trillions of dollars from the US government. We have an energy crisis in Europe. We have f fertilizer shortages that will inevitably lead to food shortages, rampant inflation, critical element shortages, and 
trillions of dollars devoted to an energy transition. So we've got to see this on the small scale level. We've seen individuals hoarding supplies. We've seen companies. But what's going to happen when countries and governments and the biggest capital allocators over the world pour trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars into an energy transition or into securing critical elements? I know you guys are at a mining conference, so you probably know the answer to this. So when I think about this and I think about the kind of investments that I want to make, I'm looking for what I would call a Winnie the Pooh trade. A Winnie the Pooh trade is so simple that any idiot can do it. Now, I was rereading Winnie the Pooh. I just had it. It's my first kid. He's 10 months old now. And I was reading through it, and there's this line in there that says, those who are clever, who have a brain, never understand anything. And I think that happens a lot when investing, that people tend to find a way to make things very, very complicated, when in reality, they can find trades that are so obvious, that are so easy, if you just have two things, if you have simplicity and you have patience. Have any of you guys ever done one of these where you make an investment and it was just like such a layup to you from the get-go that you just couldn't see how it would go wrong? Actually, anyone? Yeah? So like for me, when I think of where I think we've really knocked it out of the park at Resource Insider and that, and like the most obvious trade was in uranium. So we set up a small uranium fund in 2018. Uh, it was the simplest trade I've ever done in my entire life. I looked at the price that uh, uranium miners needed to build more mines, and I looked at the price that uranium was currently going for, and I saw a huge discrepancy, and then I bought a basket of uranium stocks. And now, since that was a fund, I'm not legally able to tell you the returns of that, but I would suggest you go look at a chart of NextGen or Cameco or any of those things and look where uranium price has done since 2018. It was very, very, very simple. Um, and these things, I think, happen all the time. And they're happening right now in resources. Uh, one of the things we're prioritizing right now is energy. We're spending a lot of time and money investing in energy projects in the US. Um, but that's not the point of this conversation. The biggest trade that I think I've seen in my career, this absolute no-brainer, is something called carbon credits. Is, anyone, is everyone familiar with what a carbon credit is? A carbon credit is basically created by any activity that removes or reduces a ton of greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. These activities can range from planting trees, conserving rainforest, uh, renewable energies, improved household item efficiencies, that sort of thing. But effectively, to become net zero, a company that's generating a million tons of greenhouse gas per year if they buy a million carbon credits, they effectively balance the teeter-totter. That's zero. A million emissions out, a million emissions in, that's net zero. And it's very important to note that it's net zero and not gross zero, right? No one's assuming we can actually get to no emissions. So when you hear about the race to net zero, the implication really is that you have to purchase carbon credits. And it's interesting, you know, I'm here in Vancouver, I have a lot of friends that are extremely left-leaning, and they tell me, Jamie, carbon credits are bullshit, they don't do enough, they're an excuse for the energy companies, they're ruining the world, it doesn't matter anyways, the world's over in five years, how could you do this to us? And then I also run a mining newsletter, and I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are very right-leaning. And they say to me, God damn it, Jamie, why would you do this? What are you, a shill for the World Economic Forum? How on earth could you promote these things? And what I would say is that's totally not the point. The point is I'm talking to you like an investor, not an activist. And my thought is you need to ask yourself, is this a commodity that people are going to buy? And are there enough of them to meet that demand? And the answer to this in a way I've probably never seen anywhere else is unequivocally no. So, there's really only one number you need to rec remember on this slide here. So Shell Energy, one of the biggest energy companies in the world, is committed to buying 120 million carbon credits per year every year from 2030 onward. 
Last year, there were 100 million credits sold globally. So one company is in buying the entire market, plus 20%, and they're going to do it every year going forward. And so is BP, and so is Total, and so is Exxon, and so is Amazon, and so is Microsoft, and so is every mining company in the world. Mark Carney um, said that he figured this market should be a $100 billion market. Last year, it was about a billion dollars. So to put that into perspective, this is the carbon credit market with respect to the gold market. Every year, there's about $200 billion worth of gold mined and sold. Last year, there was a billion dollars of carbon credits. This nice little graph here, this chart, represents every ton of greenhouse gas that humans emit every year. That's 50 billion tons annually. That is how many carbon credits we used last year. So 0.1 billion tons were offset, a tiny, tiny part of, portion of the market. Now, you can say we're going to improve efficiencies, we're going to reduce emissions, we're going to uh, organically reduce our greenhouse gas uh, emissions and impact, but assuming you actually only need to offset 20% of the market. I think that's a very reasonable ass assumption because steel manufacturing, heavily, heavily carbon uh, intensive, Cement manufacturing represents 8% of all emissions. These are things that are not easily reduced away. But even if you only offset 20%, that's going to be 10 billion credits per year. That represents 100 times growth. Importantly, carbon credits today are valued or trading at about an average of $10 a credit. What we did is we consolidated um, price predictions from basically every credible uh, consulting firm, bank, analysis group, et cetera, and they range from that. So over the next uh, 30 years, they expect they'll be between 80 and $175 per credit. Today, they're $10 a credit. Let's look at what that could actually mean for the market. So remember, gold, $200 billion market. Today, carbon credits, $1 billion market, 100 million credits sold. If we can get to 20% of total emissions offset, that makes us a $100 billion market. Huge growth at today's prices. Assuming we actually increase in price, we hit those price projections, at $20, it's a $200 billion market. At $40, a $400 billion market. Again, $40, $40 a credit is very, very conservative with respect to the predictions out there. This is a market that is twice the size of gold. Um, that has about three or four publicly listed company and needs literally hundreds of billions of dollars to develop it. So, carbon potential. Um, limited options, you know, it's very nice to think of this idea that we're just going to organically reduce away greenhouse gas emissions, but that is unequivocally impossible. Uh, renewable energy is not going to get us there. The amount of metals and materials that will be need to mine and produce to get us there is astronomical. The only path to getting there in the next 50 years is carbon credits. So it's literally in the name of net zero. Demand. Uh, every major company, bank, and government in the world has committed to being net zero by 2040 or 2050. There's a huge, huge demand coming. Supply, uh, there's very, very little projects out there. Uh, they're underfunded, underdeveloped. There's very few people doing this. And growth. It's predicted to be a 20 to 40 times growth. Um, I would say there is a limited amount of time to invest in this. So we started Vita Carbon because we saw the opportunity. The IRRs we're consistently seeing across projects are in the 30 to 40 percent range. This is what Franco Nevada was seeing in the gold space in the 1980s and 1990s. There's going to be a lot of capital that recognizes this, that's going to flood into the space, and it's going to crush those returns down. So now there's a very, very brief opportunity to capture that, to pluck the low-hanging fruit. And the way I looked at this personally is there's a chance to take carbon and turn it into an asset on your balance sheet, because very soon it's going to be a liability in everything we do. And that's why we started Vita Carbon, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much, everyone.